And hello, everyone, and welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I am Darren Jaime, and we thank you for joining us. Now, if you're asking the question, what is this show about? Well, we take a look at a lot of the inequities that people face. We promote multiple points of view. We also promote civic engagement, and we try to raise awareness. So we invite you to stay connected to us, because the Social Justice Forum begins right now. And welcome back to the show. We're glad to have you with us again. I am Darren Jaime. Our next guest is a native of New York. She actually tirelessly strives to build a better future for New Yorkers, for her child, as well as families in underprivileged neighborhoods. Now, alongside numerous not-for-profit organizations dedicated to serving the city's youth, she's actually raising an awareness right now. And when we talk about raising an awareness, raising an awareness about the impending budget that's coming, the reductions that are in that budget for youth services, which include runaway as well as homeless beds. Or she said runaway youth and homeless beds. And we've got now joining us council member of District 16, Althea Stevens. And uh, council member Stevens, thank you so much for being with us. Hello. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. No, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk. And uh, really, when we talk about uh, where we are as a city, we're faced with so much that's going on. I mean, you look around and you see, uh, from some perspectives, people feel like the city's booming. You can see construction going up. You can see things happening. You can see production happening. But yet and still, um, there are also some areas that are being challenged. And when we talk about homelessness, a huge issue uh, in this city. And from your perspective, how do you how do you first of all see the homeless crisis in New York City? Well, I mean, I think even something that you just said is around, um, around you know, we see the city booming and things are really moving in a positive direction. Um, and that is the truth. And that's the case in, in that in, in some ways. Right. But we also have to remember we were in a pandemic for two years and we are still coming out of that recovery. And one of the issues that we're having in the city is during the pandemic, we got an additional federal money, which was great for us. And we were able to kind of like ramp up on our services. One of the reasons we're having some issues around budgeting right now, when we're thinking about like the homeless crisis and we're talking about budget cuts, that is because the federal money that we we got because of stimulus money is drying up. And so some of the things that we were paying, you know, services for, for homeless services, youth services, education, we won't have available. And so, you know, we've been really trying really hard to kind of prepare for this moment, but we knew coming into office two years down the line, this was going to be the case and why we're in the position that we're in. And so we're going to have to make some tough decisions while the city is still recovering from um, the pandemic. Right. Let's look at your district for a minute. Talk to me about how you see the homeless crisis in your district. Well, listen, my district, I'm District 16. We have a lot of shelters. Um, I, I tell that to people all the time. We have been inundated with a number of shelters. And listen, these are people, these are brothers and sisters. Um, and we want them here. We want to be able to house them. But if you look throughout the city, there is d- disproportionately amount of shelters in certain areas where there's not. And so in my, in my district, which is why you see so um, much um, poverty here, because we have such a concentration of shelters. Um, And so with that, that means we should be getting additional services, but we don't. So we have a lot of families we have in the city. We have the highest number of young people who are in shelters. Um, And and we really need to think about what is our solution to getting to a path of long-term housing and really this and not this pathway to shelters, right? Because a lot of families, which is why the city council passed the city fence voucher, because we're really looking and thinking about how do we keep families in homes? And a lot of times families are in homes and they get evicted and end up in the shelter. But for us, we were thinking about how do we keep families in their homes? How do we keep people and New Yorkers in their homes opposed to ending up in the shelters? Because that's part of the reason why we're in this crisis. Yeah. When we look at what's happening right now across the city, we're seeing an increase in homelessness. But I was sharing with some other people and some colleagues in a broadcast that was saying, listen, one of the bigger challenges that we're going to be talking about in the time to come is what's happened since COVID. Uh, We had a lot of people who we couldn't evict anybody based on the regulations that are out there. The courts were backed up. And now you've got people who are going to receive, well, who receive this money. They haven't paid their rent. You've got evictions at an all-time high. 
Um, and there is a chance that even with what we're seeing right now in your own area, that you'll see an increase just based on what's happened with COVID. I mean, and, and and thank you for bringing it up because I think sometimes people forget that, right? Like we were in two years where people came out of the pandemic and had years upon, like at that point, two years of backs up on rent and they were paying what they can. You know, ERAP came in and that really helped and saved a lot of people and the rent moratorium. But the reality is, we are in a situation that we're kind of like still coming out of. And I know it seems so long ago when the pandemic happened, but these are some of the, the ripple effects that are that were the New Yorkers are still feeling. And so I think, you know, like I said, that's why the City Feps vouchers is going to be really important to kind of keep families in their homes so that they can get some subsidies. And also, too, thinking about how are we also building up a housing infrastructure, right? Um, a lot of affordable housing in the last year has not been um, built. And so thinking about how are we also building affordable housing? And also for me, and especially a district like mine, where we have so much affordable housing, how are we diversifying that stock as well? Because I think the other thing we don't talk about is like upward mobility, right? So if you have a district and you just have so much concentration of affordable housing, what ends up happening is if you get a promotion or you, you know, you get a little bit more money, you're priced out of these um, areas. And so thinking about how do we also, as we're thinking about this crisis and coming out of it, is really developing a housing plan that works for everyone. And I know um, our speaker, she came out last year for her state of the city and really had a lot of bold ideas around housing. And I know the mayor has a city of yes. And so housing is at the top of everyone's mind. And how do we get people into long-term housing, but also trying to have a real long-term plan about how people can get into homes, stay in their homes and have dignity in their communities. Yeah. I want to take a, a moment and switch focuses for right now, because I know also that you're the chair of the committee on youth. Yes, and I uh, am. Yeah. And so I'm proud and happy to be. And listen, and, and we need people to be youth advocates, particularly at a time like this. I think if the youth uh, ever needed time for services, uh, now's the time with so much that's going on out here in our community, uh, the need for youth services and, and advocacy for youth is huge. And so I know you're taking the bull by the horns. You're running with it. And you're you're dealing with that, but you're also dealing with some challenges. I mean, there's some proposed cuts that are out there that are in the area of youth services. And, um, you know, I'll just ask you, the, I'll, I'll throw you the beach ball. How do you feel about it? Well, listen, I think for me, understanding where we're at, right? Like, I am not a person who believes that, like, all right, we're in a crisis. We all have to tighten our belts. And the way I've been really putting this is like, what what is it that we need right now? What are our needs as far as our youth to make them get out of any circumstances that they've been in? But one of the things we also have to highlight is youth unemployment in New York City is at an all time high. And so I really believe that this is a correlation to what we're seeing in our community. Right. So we're seeing um, we have our detention sisters that are, that are at 95 percent capacity. We're seeing a number of youth who are like, you know, getting into trouble and all of those things for me is because we are not providing the services that they need. You know, I tell people this all the time. When I was 16 years old, I was able to go out, get a job. You know, I worked at Kataiva, Homeop, all these different places. But that is not the case for our young people. Most places will not hire you hire you until you're 18. So we really need to think about and reimagine what youth development looks like in addition to what does workforce development look like for young people because we're not giving them a lot of options. And so for me, that's a need. And so that's a place where we need to continue to invest in and say, how do we make sure that these are the things that are working? In addition, I'm always talking about, we need to look at all our programs and say, are they meeting the goals that we want? Are they doing the things that we want? And so if you ever listen to any of my hearings, I'm always saying things like, how do we know it's working? How are you evaluating this program? How do we know that it's doing the things that we want it to do? Because those things need to be part of the conversation. Because if it's not working, then for me, it's saying like, well, maybe we need to shift the money, shift it to the things that are working and things like that. And I think that's the way you go about when you're going into a, tif a, a tough fuss fiscal crisis, you need to really be evaluating and looking at the things that are working and focus your attention on that while we're developing and, and, and getting out of this crisis. So when we're done with the crisis, we can then now invest in the additional programs. You know, one of the things I find is that sometimes when we have youth programs, they're, they're not enough, number one. Uh, and another challenge that I find is sometimes some of the programs uh, that are led, and I know we can't, I'm, I won't name specifics, but I'll say there's some agencies out there whose relevance comes into question. How do we deal with the issue of 
you got a name. We know your organization. Um, you've been around, but the reality is not relevant, not effective. Honestly, this is one of the things I talk about all the time. So a lot of organizations and, and even thinking about some of our bigger organizations who've been around and because they, they have a name and they've been around a long time, they've been doing the work, but because they're so big, they're overstretched. And it feels like we don't want to have this conversation, right? And so because the way the procurement process is set up, it's a lot easier to go to an organization that is a little bit more fiscally sound, who has money that can do the reimbursement stuff. But then you have little organizations who are actually on the ground doing the outreach, reaching the kids, reaching the young people, reaching the, the um, program participants, but they cannot sustain with the, the way the procurement process is set up. So, you know, I say it all the time, the procurement system is, inherently racist. And so it's set up so organizations that have bigger budgets and are able to sustain and really do this reimbursement process could process um could really could really move forward. Whereas like smaller organizations then are stuck and can't push and really do the work because they can't survive on um they can't survive on the reimbursement. And so I've been doing a lot of work around reforming this procurement process, working with the controller's office, working with Mox to really make sure that we are removing some of these bound, um, boundaries that are up that these smaller organizations are facing when trying to get contracts with the city so that we can really open up the horizon of these things. Because for me, the same way I'm going to hold DYCD and, you know, city agencies accountable when they're not showing up to provide the services for our providers is the same way we have to hold these agencies responsible because I've gone to a number of agencies and I'm not naming no names right. where they have a contract for 150 right. students and they have maybe like 20 students in the building right like and it's real and so that's why when people say like we don't have programming I'm like we actually have a lot of programming in the city, but are we reaching the kids that need to be there? And are these agencies really going where the kids are and meeting with them where they're at and not just having this like, well, we're here, they should come to us mentality. Yeah, I mean, you're speaking my language. I speak this language. And, uh, you know, that's a part of this show that we're not traditional and conventional. We really, I really- I'm not a traditional council member either, so. Right, and I'm not a traditional and <laughs> conventional host either. I can call it like it is. And what it is, what it is, it is. And the reality is that you got a lot of organizations out there. They receive a lot of money. And the fact is they don't have the reach. They're no longer reaching people. They're no longer doing it, but they've got the money and, simply because- and honestly, I don't know if they want to reach the people. Yeah, honestly. that's- because, That's you know, another thing for me is like, even when I look at organizations and I come to your organization and no one in that organization is from that community or lives or maybe has ties to that community, I start to wonder, well, what are we doing here? Right? Like, there's a lot like, especially organizations that been in communities for 30, 40 years, you should be able to find people who are doing the community work and partner with them and hire them to be a part of this work, because those things actually really matter. Right. It's called a check. And that's what people are after. They want a check that's going to keep them comfortable. It's a check that's going to keep them sustainable. But we really need to check the people who are getting the check. And, and don't worry, because I'm here to check them. I hear you. <laughs> now, now, help me with this, because we, we you, you, you talk about one thing, but capacity building is also something, right? Because we know that the bar's already been set, right? And, and so for organizations, you have to have a certain threshold. And I know you talked about lowering that threshold so that people can be able to get that money. Well, I'm just saying lowering the threshold for like procurement requirements, right? Yes. Right. I'm not talking about services or any of those no, things. No, no, no. I'm on the same page with you. I'm okay. on the same page. Like when we talk about procurement requirements and really being able to meet the needs, because sometimes the organizations know they're not able to meet the procurement requirements. But yeah, you know, there's no so requirements. Much paperwork. It's like sometimes it's redundant. Um, you know, I mean, it's just so many things. It takes so long for your contract to get registered. I mean, it's all these different things that like hinder them from actually doing the work. And for me, it's like, and I was just having this conversation this morning. We were talking about there are things that were put in place and maybe like the 80s and the 90s. And it's like, is this still relevant today? So like I said, I'm always asking, is this relevant? Does this make sense? And is it doing the things that we need to make it done? Right. And so we need to also be evaluating these processes to see if they're antiquated, if it's still relevant and making sure it makes sense. And the reality is the procurement process is very much in the stone ages. You know, the draconian process is, is 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 rough, right? And we know that they've got old setups and really trying to get around that. Um, 
and you know that makes the job harder. Now you got the money. We're trying to let's get back to the money for a minute. The money's out there, but we know the money's also being dried up. We, let's talk about runaway youth for a minute, right? In beds. Um, what are the challenges that you're seeing right there? So homeless runaway youth and getting an increase in our older um, older youth beds has been my number one fight for the past two years since I've been here. And it's also interesting and even to think about when we when even when the, the mayor put out his plan for um, homelessness in New York, there was no mention of homeless runaway youth, um, you know, through advocacy, you know, and our young people fighting back and pushing back. He ended up adding it afterwards. But like it's even it's it's so sad because they're not part of the conversation. And because they're actually homeless runaway youth falls under DYCD, it often gets overlooked and no one really talks about it. And, you know, it's, it's a place that we, we need to really invest. We have homeless young people throughout the city, right? We have drop-in centers throughout in, every fi- in all five boroughs where young people are coming at any point to get help and get services. You know, they're also always trying to find additional beds. But specifically for our um, young people between the ages of um, 21 and 24, that's one of the places that we're struggling at, right? Because a lot of times they don't want to go to the DSS, DSS shelters because they've experienced some really bad things, whether it's being robbed or not treated well and just, you know, being taken advantage of. And so that is where I've really been fighting to get an increase. In the city alone, we only have 60 beds designated for them young for those young people. And the reality is, I think for the last couple of um, months, a couple of them have been offline. And so for me, it's like we need to really invest in that piece because young people have said time and time again, this is something that they need and this is something that they want and so even last year when they had this huge mandate where young people were no longer able to sleep at drop-in centers and it caused a lot of controversy because young people did not have anywhere else to go and so they were saying that they couldn't sleep there and that they had to like they can come in and get services but they were not allowed to sleep because they wanted to expedite people being you know um being referred out to get um, long-term beds. But the reality is we just don't have enough beds to keep up with the capacity. And so this is a place that a lot of people aren't talking about. We as a city have not invested in it. And thinking about going into a tough budget, this is a place we actually still need to invest in because we have not invested in this piece for our young people and they deserve better. Yeah. And when we talk about young people, you're on the ground, you're having conversations with them. What are they saying? Because, you know, we hear all the time what the media portrays. And I'm not one that portrays a stereotype. Uh, we see the crime. We see the things that they're involved in. And, yes, it's sad to see our young people engaging in these activities that really are detrimental to their health and also to the, you know, to the quality of life of our community. However, on the other side of that, uh, they're a minority compared to the majority of youth that are out there doing some great things, uh, excelling in school, getting scholarships, uh, trying to get to the next level in life. What are you hearing from young people with regards to needs that they feel? You know, I worked in youth development for 20 years. The young people told me to run for office. And so for me, I I want every conversation I have, I'm always bringing young people into the conversation. Uh, And I think for me, what I hear from young people, they don't feel heard or seen. Like that is what I was told to when young people told me to run for office. They said no one's ever asked me to vote. No ever, no one, no one has, no one ever wanted me to vote, and no one cares. And that is still the same sentiment when it comes to programming, when it comes to things that we want in our community. They're not part of the conversation. That's why for me, I have a youth advisory board that's strictly for youth. We actually just met less than a week ago where we were able to talk about. What do they want to see in the community? Where I should spend our budget? You know, what 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 programs they would like to see? They're, they're also going to be spending some time to create and host a youth event and really have them lead this conversation. Um, you know, I think too often we have a lot of adults who think that they know best. And for me, I'm thinking like, yeah, I know some things, but I don't know what the youth need, right? And so for me, it's like going to them. They are the experts in this field. They are the one who are going to be impacted. And so for me, it's like, I need to step aside and set the stage up so that they can take the, the reins and really start stepping into leadership roles. And so it's really important for me as an elected official to make sure that we are creating space for young people to be seen, heard, and listened to on a regular basis. 
So you want to get my fire going? Here's my fire, right? My fire gets going when I get this. I got adults who are making decisions about young people and what should happen to the lives of young people. And you have no relationship with young people whatsoever. That's a you problem. don't know how many meetings I'm in and they'll start talking about young people and I will raise my hand and say, hi guys, there's no young people in this room so we shouldn't be having this conversation. Right. Or, or, or even like in your own household, you don't have a great relationship with kids already to even or, know what they want. But then you don't don't get job, me started. And, and, and you want to go to a job and make some decisions and talk about what's needed for kids. You can't even work in your own household well. How can you effectively work in these organizations? And that's why oh, I think that sometimes there's a failure in the delivery of services. I will always say that there are a lot of services out there that are in name only because we're not really meeting people, you know, where they are. What can we do to change the game in that area uh, so that way it can make your job and a lot of people who are really what I call boots on the ground um, doing their job? What can we do to, to, to help to reinforce that? Honestly, I'm going to be honest. I think I've been here disrupting and that has been my job to disrupt. So because of some of the things that I've been doing and talking about, like I said, in every space I'm in, I bring young people with me. And whether that's me bringing them into the conversation or actually having a young person be there in presence, I'm bringing young people with me. And it has not. And, and for me, I feel like the conversation often has changed. And I also see how other people are now doing it, right? Like I was the only person for a while talking about a youth advisory board strictly with youth, right? Other people had advisory boards. There was adults and da da da. And I was very clear: I only want youth on it. Now other people are doing advisory boards with just youth, right? And so for me, I'm leading by example and using my platform as a council member to say that the young people aren't the future, they're the now. And so we need to now start getting them ready to walk into these positions and also be part of the conversation. I might think I'm young, but I'm not, right? Like I have my chance and my time. And so I can give them advice. I can give them guidance and I give I can give them support, but they're the ones that should be leading the conversations mm -hmm. about what they want to see, not only now, but in the future, because they're the ones who are going to be here and in these positions, in these roles, and we have to set them up for success. And yeah. that's what has not been happened. As elders, and I take my position as an elder seriously, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to teach them. You're supposed to get them ready and set them up for success. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Listen, I, we can talk about youth all day, but I got to ask a question about small business because we know that's the lifeblood, right, of America. And that's right there in the heart of the district, the small businesses that are out there. How are we dealing with the issue of small businesses uh, and their economic recovery, particularly after, you know, COVID. A lot of them didn't get the PPP money. Um, and some of them right now are closed down. I'm going by some places. I'm like, man, you didn't make it. Um, give me give me your assessment of what's, what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I've been working a lot with the Bronx Chamber of Commas of like really trying to do some assessments in the district to see where folks are at and what services they need. i um, also partnered with um, the chair of small businesses and, and reaching out to CUNY to see how we can get some of our CUNY um, graduates and CUNY students to kind of do some work in these small businesses, um, especially in my district. A lot of our districts don't are not necessarily the most tech savvy. So how do we then partner them with some of our CUNY students and internships to come and help them get online and get them in these places? So, you know, they are definitely at the top of my mind. Also thinking about how do we foster entrepreneurship, um, along with um, a few of my colleagues, Councilmember Riley, um, Natasha, and Councilmember Lewis, we were able to get a million dollars in the budget two years ago to do an entrepreneurship for young people so that they can also start to learn how to create and do businesses. And so that's actually been in the budget for the last two years. And last year we had over, you know, over a hundred plus young people who started and created their own businesses. Um, so, you know, it's just really important that we continue to foster this environment and make sure that we're providing them the services. SBS has a number of services. So we've done a couple of outreach things with them so that we, so that businesses in our community could know what's available, what supports are there, and really trying to connect the dots. 
Because access to resources is really huge, right? I think the biggest problem is that when the resources are available, sometimes these small businesses don't have the access. And let me go a step further. We talk about capacity too, right? There's also that capacity component that sometimes they don't have the capacity to go through the same kind of procurement that we're talking yep. about uh, to be able to reach and get this money handed down to them. So that way they can be sustainable. But then we right. find that if you're a bigger corporation, you can make it and you can pull it. Yeah, you can figure it out. And if you, you know, especially with some of our small businesses, they have less than 10 employees, right? They don't, they don't, they're, they don't have time to do the research and do the procurement stuff. And, and also, right, because when we talk about procurement, a lot of people don't realize that on the city side to become a vendor, it's a lot of paperwork. It's very um, um, daunting. And sometimes people just don't have the time to do that and to go after some of these contracts that could really help, but it's just really hard and they just don't have the capacity. So that's why, like I said, I've been really partnering with the Bronx Chamber of Commerce who have been phenomenal partners in this work and really have been doing a lot of outreach in my district to the businesses to ask and see the things that they need so that we can then connect them to the services. Yeah. And so for yourself, obviously, a lot of work that's being going that's going on in the district. Uh, what are the things that maybe residents need to be paying attention to at a time like this uh, within the district that maybe they're not so familiar of? Well, you know, a lot of people are forgetting that it's actual election season right now. So a lot of people are not I, like I've been on the street talking to folks and people are like, wait, it's an election. So it is an election year. Also, too, one of the things I always like to say my office should be a lot of people's first stop because what happens is my office is typically the last stop. And so when people get there and they're so frustrated, right? They come to me because they're like, oh, I've been calling this, this agency or, you know, HRA and these things and no one's been able to help. If you are having an issue, always feel free to reach out to our office. And if we can't help you, we will direct you to the folks that can help you. And also just like 311 is our best friend. Any issues that we're seeing in our community, calling 311 and getting that documented and, and um, put into the system is really important because a lot of times when I'm reaching out to agencies, they're like, well, we didn't know this was an issue. And so that was one of the things I always want to just like uplift and highlight, like 311 is our best friend in our community and we need to use it a lot more. Yeah. I, I was going to ask that question. Are we finding that a lot of people are using 311? I mean, or because the, the, what I'm finding is when I have conversations with people they're looking for help and that's not even on that's not even on the equation. I know. You would be surprised. Like, I mean, I've been at a number of hearings where I'm like, you know, we're having this issue with sanitation or we're having this issue with um, you know, um DOT or bike lane. And they're like, no, they were like, how will we know? And I'm like, you're right. And so that's why for me, saying like calling through one is important. Even sometimes people will call my office with something and I'm like, do me a favor. Can you log that into 311 and call us back with your confirmation number? Because we can even use that to, to call the agency and say, hey, this complaint was put in. This is the confirmation number. So people are calling. And so that actually helps us to really be able to fight and push things along. Yeah. And so for people who need to get in touch with your office, um, how do they go about reaching your office? How do they go about connecting if they've got a need or they just simply want some information? Listen, we are on social media. All of our stuff is out on social media. You can always reach out to our office, our um um our email address. Um, you can reach out through us. Our email is district16 at New York City at council.nyc.gov. And all of our social medias, we're always super active. Um, you can find any information. I tell people all the time, 90% of the time, I'm answering my social media. So it is. it will be me responding. Um, and people are always surprised about that. But it's really important for me to be connected with the community and connected with the people and hear concerns. Well, you know that doesn't always happen now. we got some rep that's going to say, hey, thank you for reaching out. So not it's not me. Really it is not a responsive. <laughs> it is 99% of the time it is me. People are always like, wait, I'm like, it's out there. They're like, for real? I'm like, it's me. Right. Well, listen, I thank you for being with us. And really, it's an opportunity to share a lot that's going on. I wish we had you in the studio, but unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties. All right. So I just mean you could invite me again so I can come to the studio. You're coming. All right. How about that? So this is done it. deal. Done deal. But you thank invite you. Me, I'll be there. All right. Well, I want to thank you for so much for sharing. I think these conversations need to be had. And as we get into the new year, definitely we'll bring you back so you can give us an update and also what the public needs to know. So uh, Councilmember Althea Stevens, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. All righty. That's Councilwoman 
Althea Stevens, District 16, giving us the latest on what we need to know about homeless youth services, small business, uh, what's going on in the community, and the things that you need to know. We talk about these things here at the Social Justice Forum. We'll be right back right after this. If you're buzzed and doing this, to make yourself feel okay to drive, CWX. Ah. You're not okay to drive. Y G K L V W. Uh, regular you. It's important to get a flu shot each and every year because flu viruses are constantly changing and immunity from the vaccine decreases over time. Flu vaccines are updated annually to work against that year's viruses. The best time to get your shot is in the fall, but getting it later can still help. Getting a flu shot lowers your risk of getting sick. And if you do happen to get flu, it's likely to be less severe. hard part. You quit smoking. Now do the easy part and get scanned for lung cancer. If you smoked, you may still be at risk, but early detection could save your life. Talk to your doctor and learn more at savedbythescan.org. We all know what it's like to feel alone, but it just takes one new connection. Want to get out of here? to empower many. This is unbelievable. It doesn't take a superhero to bring forces together. We all have the power to reach out. Let's go! And help someone feel like they belong. Pretty cool, huh? We are stronger together. My character, Shazam, knows all about growing up in a family full of teenage superheroes. They're bold. Where's everyone going? To fight crime. Okay. Adventurous. Shazam! There's never a dull moment. Ah! And no matter what happens, they'll always have your back. All they need is a place to grow and be themselves. And the best part is, you don't have to be a superhero to adopt a teen. Learn more about adopting a teen from foster care. Visit AdoptUSKids.org. You can't imagine the reward. Welcome back. The three-month-long war in Sudan appears to be transitioning into a crucial and uncertain new phase. Recent developments show army leaders are now more open to considering peace talks, even as paramilitary forces assert that victory is within reach. The immediate future remains uncertain. However, it's important to note that the conflict has already brought Sudan perilously close to collapse, with violence spreading beyond the capital and engulfing more regions of the country. Here now to tell us more, we've got PhD candidate of history at Yale University, Bayan ba uh, Abu Bakar. And uh, Bayan, thank you so much for being with us. When we look at this crisis that's going on in uh, Sudan, uh, what is significant for us to know here? Uh, well, first, thank you so much for having me and for giving me the space uh, to talk about this. Um, I mean, I think that there's we can think about the war, in, the current war in Sudan on a number of levels. The first being obviously the domestic, uh, just the scale of human loss and destruction. Uh, I think up until this point, the UN has reported that 3.3 million people have been displaced, over 4,000 have died, um, and rape is being used as a weapon of war uh, from all sides. 
And these numbers are, of course, uh, highly underestimated. And then on a second level, this war isn't just, uh, you know, a result of Sudan's very violent history since independence, nor is it a result of uh, the conflicts that arose within the military and its different uh, factions since the 2019 or the 2018 revolution. But it's also something that, um, you know, many players on the global stage are invested in. That includes Saudi Arabia, that includes the UAE, Libya, uh, Egypt, the U.S., the U.K. There's a whole list of players who are invested in a certain type of um, non-democracy existing in Sudan because it allows for the control of Sudanese resources, uh, which, you know, is to the detriment of Sudanese people, but to the betterment of certain elements of the world economy. Um, so, yeah, on, on two, I think the two of the most important things to understand at this moment are just like the scales of human destruction are massive. And at this point, I, I don't really see them receding. Um, and two, that this is not at all a local conflict, but very much a global one. I guess the big question is, how did we really get here? I mean, this is not just something that happened overnight. This is certainly something that's happened over time. Yeah. Um, so the Sudanese military has had a history of externalizing its military power since the very beginning of its inception, since uh, independence. But especially when it came to, you know, the genocide in Darfur. Um, so the war in Darfur, the genocide in Darfur began because certain uh, uh, non-Arab farmers were protesting against uh, the, gov the government's marginalization of them. The government couldn't respond by just sending out the military. It didn't have that sort of manpower. So it empowered or externalized military power to militias that were already armed, uh, Arab people who are racialized as Arabs, uh, who are nomads, who already had various conflicts over land and resources with these groups that were protesting against the government. So over the past 20 years, uh, this was a group that came to be known as the Janjaweeds. They grew, uh, they grew to have more power, more control over the West's very rich resources, including gold. Um, and then in 2017, the Janjaweeds were formally incorporated into the military as the rapid support forces, as a part of uh, as a part of the military and as a part of the state, even our former president Omar al-Bashir called Hemeti, who was a leader of the RSF, as his protector. Uh, so over time, you had you know these two sort of dominant factions of the military rise up to uh, you know the, the military having its own eminent place, and then the RSF slowly gaining power over time. Then with the with the war in Yemen, uh, which was uh, which should really be called the genocide in Yemen, which was funded and orchestrated by the Saudi Arabian and the, and the Emirati government, a lot of uh, the soldiers that were on the ground in Yemen were actually hired mercenaries from the Janjaweed, and they were exploiting the conflict in Darfur. Uh, giving, you know, uh, cash in dollars to men or boys as young as 15 years old, the New York Times reported, to go serve the war in Yemen. Um, and so, you know, this chain of uh, this chain of resources, this chain of money, as well as Hamiti's growing ties to Russia, to the Wagner Group, uh, to sending gold to Saudi Arabia, to the UAE, only gave the RSF more of a powerful position uh, in the military and also one that was independent of the military itself. And so with the revolution, you know, when the people, you know, fought for democracy, initially, we had thought we had made an inroads, but then, of course, you know, the military came in, uh, and they led, uh, they, they started, they, they, did a, they did a massacre on June 3rd of 2019, which sort of ended the path towards democracy. At that point, you know, it was decided that we would have a transitional government that would be made up of civilians and the military, the military being incorporated uh, of elements of the, the former military and the RSF, and civilian government made up of the prime minister uh, and his cabinet. Uh, the military led a counter-revolutionary coup on October 25th, uh, 2021 which completely eroded the transitional government and made the military the eminent head of power. At that point, it was clear that the real power struggle was between the RSF and the military, because even you had a month later after the coup, where you had Hemeti, who was again the leader of the RSF, saying that the military went about the coup the wrong way, that the RSF had a certain uh, imaginary for ruling Sudan and what that looked like. So, you know, this conflict has been brewing, you know, many would say, since the 1980s, when you know these militias were first, these militias in the West were first funded and created by Mahmoud Gaddafi of Libya, to, and then emboldened in the early 2000s with the genocide in Darfur, and then again with uh, the 2019 revolution and the 2021 counter coup. So in many ways, this was an, an inevitability, an, an inevitability, but in many ways, you know, it was enabled by uh, global actors as well. Yeah, we're hearing a lot about the crisis 
called a Sudan crisis, if you will. It's being called mm -hmm. Sudan crisis. It's not being labeled uh, as a war. Why are we not hearing it being labeled as a war? I mean, that's a good question. You know, I think on many levels, you can't really call this a civil war. It's not as if, you know, one part of the country is trying to secede over the other or that it's a conflict between the government and some, you know, uh, an, an actor foreign to the government. It's really like the state fighting within itself and collapsing within itself. So the crisis is really one that is happening within the military. It's completely, you know, uh, becoming uh, disfragmented as an institution. But the war, it seems like the war is happening to Sudanese people in terms of like, you know, the violence of war, the destruction, the loss of homes, the looting, all of that is taking place. But it's like, most Sudanese people would say, I mean, of course, others would disagree that they have no stakes in either party, that we don't want the military, we don't want the RSF, we just truly just want a civilian government. That's been the slogan for a lot of the most revolutionary actors and the most forward thinking uh, actors known as the uh, Revolutionary Neighborhood Committees. Uh, that's been their, their main party line since 2019 is that there's no negotiation, no compromise, uh, a, 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 and no deal with the military. So the crisis is really between the military, but the war is happening to us. And I think, you know, on a global stage, you know, the loss and the violence that happens to the average ordinary citizen is unfortunately less important than what is happening to the state, to the institution, because this is who the West of the world is dealing with. This is who other governments are dealing with. Uh, so I have to assume that's why. But I mean, to me, it's to many others, it's a war. Yeah, and the worldwide impact. I think it it it, it gets overshadowed the fact that mm. uh, we don't know and recognize the real worldwide impact that what's going on in Sudan plays right in our very own right in our very own backyard. I, I kind of remember the Kenya bombings and uh, when the Kenya bombings were tied to the people who did the World Trade Center bombings. It seems as though we didn't pay enough attention to what was going on in Kenya. And some critics say, listen, if we paid attention to what goes on in Kenya, possibly 9-11 doesn't happen. Why should we have our eyes focused on what's happening in Sudan right now? I mean, on one level, I think that, you know, our attention, our care to other parts of the world shouldn't just be dependent on there being a sort of direct relationship to, like, what happens in the U.S. But a lot of, you know, uh, like, uh, it, what is happening in Sudan is not individual to Sudan. Now, at the moment, you see a lot of Sahelian, you see a lot of coups happening in the Sahel. I think that we're at a point in world history where, you know, the failures of the post-colonial state are becoming all the more evident. Like, the state, the nation-state model doesn't work for African countries. It doesn't, it doesn't work for most countries. I mean, the U.S. is a very violent example of that. If, like, a country keeps having to maintain its own borders through the dispossession and through the displacement of people, it's, is a nation-state model really working? But I think in Sudan in particular, you know, you have this made-up constructed state that was, whose borders were drawn by British administrators. All these people are put together. Institutions were created in a certain location in the country that gave a certain group of people power and it's slowly falling apart. Like, I think the story of Sudan is not one that is unfortunately just going to be of Sudan. Like, I think... If I can, you know, maybe this is bold of me to say this, but I think the rest of the world will eventually head in this direction where the nation state model, uh, the military state, these are not models that work. Ultimately, people want control over their lives, over their destinies. And I think, you know, investing all of our belief in this an idea that is a very new one that is from the early 20th century is just not going to work. But I think, you know, beyond the theoretical level, I think, you know, S Sudan... Sudan has fed a lot of the Arab world, a lot of the African world, in terms of, like, its produce, its resources for many of the past few years. Already, Egypt has started losing grain, already has lost access to cows. This will create a domino effect across the region that will be highly destructive. And if we look at, you know, Syria, Libya, Iraq, Sudan, like, there's not a lot of countries in the Arab or African world that are, or the Afro-Arab world that are standing. And Egypt is not really that far from its own financial and military collapse. So it's like, at the end of the day, 20 years from now, I'm not really sure what the ge geographic makeup of this world, especially this region of the world, will look like. Um, and if the U.S. keeps enabling its uh, its, its uh, counterparts in Saudi and the UAE and in, and in Israel, of course, I'm not sure that there will be much of any states, you know, standing. Yeah, that's a lot, a lot to pay attention to. I thank you for sharing the global impact because sometimes we don't know and we don't really recognize mm -hmm. what this plays out with from a global perspective. Uh, when wars like this occur. While we're looking at this crisis in Sudan, the war in Sudan, sexual violence is happening. 
Mm. Um, mm. Walk us through uh, what's happening by way of sexual violence and the impact uh, that it has. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so unfortunately, sexual violence and particularly rape are not new to Sudan's history. They were definitely, it was definitely a tactic that was used all throughout the war uh, in South Sudan, throughout the genocide in Darfur, especially the RSF, formerly known as the Janjaweed, like this is, their their main tactic is to scorch the earth and to rape women and kill men, they, and, and torture and kill men. Um, and so this was definitely something that you saw play out in the early days of the war, like, um, and when the war first broke out on April 15th, so yesterday marks four months, it was an immediate sort of, like, destruction of the earth. And also, it's like you just, you could feel, as I was driving to Khartoum to try to collect my passport, you, I could feel, you know, the interrogation of the different soldiers, you know, not being one of military men uh, trying to, you know, get me to a checkpoint, but one of people who are willing to assault me. And, you know, over time, I would say in the beginning, the threat of sexual violence wasn't as probable, but over time, and especially as more foreign entities like the UN and the IOM left, and like Sudan or Khartoum uh, essentially became a ghost town, uh, you saw the rate of sexual violence increase. Actually, Al Jazeera um, uh, yesterday posted a long-form article about the scale of sexual destruction um, in Sudan, uh, or sexual violence in Sudan. I forgot the exact number, but uh, I think Amnesty International am, am, uh, estimated that it, 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 uh, uh, it's underreported by 50%. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I mean, I think Khartoum has a much easier than places in Darfur that have historically been marginalized. Uh, multiple towns in Darfur have been destroyed. Ethnic communities in Darfur, particularly the Muslim are being targeted. There are women being targeted as well, uh, and there's rumors of um, there's rumors of uh, of women being sold in for sexual slavery on the border between Chad and uh, Chad and Western Sudan. So it's not um, unfortunately this is not surprising. It's nothing new, um, and it 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 seems to only be getting worse as the state recedes into itself and collapses into itself. And there are truly no, I mean, especially because the RSF and the military uh, continue to target civilian areas and civilian uh, hospitals, civilian places where civilians can take care of one another. The lack of uh, care for people, the lack of uh, the lack of uh, availability to treat them after violence has occurred is only making the situation much worse. So, and yeah, like I said, unfortunately, this is nothing new, but the scale has definitely reached new heights. Yeah. And so give us an idea. Where are you right now? I'm actually uh, in the UK currently. Um, I was in Sudan doing research for my PhD. I was planning on being there until October. Um, yeah, it took me a while to get out of Sudan. It was near impossible to leave. Uh, I'm an American citizen, but it, the barriers for leaving as a person of Sudanese descent were very difficult, I would have to say. It was a very hierarchical, very racist system in terms of who was deemed more important to leave, at what point and when and how. Um, so, yeah, it took me, I think, around uh, three weeks to eventually leave. Three weeks? Yeah. Well, we're glad you made it out. Talk to me about where you, you are right now. Um, obviously, uh, you're continuing to inform the world and also uh, everybody that you can about the crisis that's going on in Sudan. Recently, you had an article that was published... Uh, and uh, it was in the New York Times. Give us a little bit about your Times article and what subsequently happened after that. <laughs> um, so the impetus for that Times article, I think, was just, you know, as I said, it took me three weeks to leave... Um, to leave Sudan, and so I had to... I was actually in another area of Khartoum when the war first broke out. I was with a friend. We were doing research, so I was two hours away from the center. I wasn't able to get back to Khartoum until four days into the war um, because we left on the day that there was, like, there was... Uh, the first ceasefire was announced. Of course, you know, at this point, uh, 20 ceasefires have been announced. All of them have been broken. We drove back into the city. Um, to my friend's apartment. We realized that his friend or his roommate was kidnapped from his apartment by the RSF, so we immediately had to leave. I pick up my passport from my house. We go to Port Sudan together. Uh, my university luckily finds a way to evacuate us, but it's all contingent on us being able to get on um, an evacuation ferry that the Saudi Arabian government is running from eastern Sudan to Jeddah, uh, on the eastern side of Saudi. Um, so the first day we go to the port, the first day we get to Port Sudan, we go to the port. Um, it was a very insulting experience, uh, insulting and humiliating experience. There were around like two to three thousand people all crammed in on this one port, uh, on this one port, most of them being UN staff because two days prior, the UN had taken over 50 buses from Khartoum 
and evacuated like 700 members of their staff to Port Sudan to eventually leave through the ferry, so which caused a gas and busing crisis in Sudan as people were trying to leave to go to Egypt, most of them at least. Um, so on that day, we arrived uh, to the port immediately. Well, we waited for six hours for the Saudi Arabian ambassador to arrive. Immediately when him and the military arrived, the Saudi Arabian military arrived, they announced that no Sudanese, no Palestinians, and no Syrians are getting on the boat. And they, qu they qualify Sudanese as meaning anybody of Sudanese descent. So even if you have a foreign passport, you're not getting on. They say they're not getting Palestinians on because they're not taking more Palestinians to Saudi. And, and if, if they take any Syrians on that boat, they're, they're taking them back to Syria to serve in uh, Bashar al-Assad's uh, military. So it was very clear from the beginning that, you know, this is not going, this was not a, a free, this was not free by any means. It was not free for everybody, nor was it accessible for everybody. And so I got lucky in terms of, uh, like, I was able to make my case directly with the Saudi Arabian ambassador. And I, you know, I, I, I begged him. I basically said, I'm here alone. It's just me and my friend. Like, we don't have any of our things. We need to get back to our studies. We need to just get out of safety. Like, my parents need to know I'm okay. And he told me that, you know, as Sudanese people, we have homes. We have, um, we have families here that can take care of us, the foreigners are the priority uh, because they don't have these things. And to me, it was just the painful irony of, like, the fact that the Saudi Arabian military was directly led, like, the Saudi Arabia government directly led us to the conflict that we're in now by paying the RSF, uh, by enabling the RSF to the war in Yemen, to take, making deals with the, with the Sudanese military on this RSF for the past few years, and then to have the audacity to say that Sudanese people can, you know, watch this destruction, you know, not really considering the fact that, like, we're our homes and our families that he, you know, that he mentioned are being destroyed. To me, I was just, I don't know, I think I was shocked on a whole other level. Like, the war was already shocking just by how sudden it was, how everything broke out. But on that day, I think I... I think I swore to myself that I wouldn't, I wouldn't really let them get away, for, get away with this. Um, and I don't think they should at all, because it was just the... Uh, I've never seen such crass... such crass, openly racist, you know... Uh, such an, a crass and openly racist approach to people in a humanitarian crisis, uh, and like this, this upholding of visa of visas and borders, like at a moment like this, I think the absurdity of it all really became palpable to me. Um, and so when it came out, um, you know. Um, it made a lot of waves, I think, along the Sudanese community. A lot of people were, were grateful to have that that iteration of the story out there. Um, you know, there's many others. Like, every Sudanese person I talk to who has gone through the war has their own story. Uh, I have yet to hear what the Saudi Arabian government thinks uh, of the peace, but I'm sure if I ever try to go back into the country, I'll, I'll find out for sure. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's the gist of it. <laughs> Do you think uh, the United Nations uh, can be doing more here? What are they doing in terms of, you know, trying to stop these war crimes from going forward? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think, you know, I grew up in Sudan as a teenager. I lived in Sudan the past five months in this moment of immense crisis. I'm really, I've really lost all faith in international organizations and their capacity to really do anything for the benefit of the benefit of Sudanese people. Uh, the UN, in particular, UNITAMS or the UN mission to transit, uh, the UN mission to transition Sudan. I forget the acronym, but UNITAMS basically under head Walker Purse did nothing to nothing to uh, realize the goals of the revolution, but they just enabled and legitimized the military and the RSF as the two main heads of Sudan's government, despite the fact that they came into power through a coup. Um, and then immediately when the crisis broke out, um, they all left. They left with it, you know, faster than most Sudanese people could. The only real organization that continues to be on the ground is uh, is Doctors Without Borders. They're doing on the ground work, taking people to um, taking, taking people to hospitals, taking care of them. They're coming face to face with the threat of violence. I think over 20 doctors have been shot at or killed. And I think beyond that, like beyond the scope of um, actually helping Sudanese people take care of one another, there's not much that these international organizations can do or foreign governments can do, because all they really do is, you know, the policy aspect of trying to negotiate a sort of deal between these two, between these two violent and corrupt heads of the government. But it's like nobody, nobody wants that. Nobody, of course, we want to enter the war, but we don't want to come to a negotiated settlement, settlement of the two people who got us to this point. So I think, you know, the UN, the US, all of these governments that for so long have played a very big role in shaping Sudan's future, what they need to do now is really just listen to 
what do these people want to make of their future and try to realize that. And I think a way, a, a direct way of supporting them is by supporting the resistance committees that have led, um, that have been, you know, have, have led the revolution since 2019, have been taking care of their neighborhoods and taking care of their people uh, since the beginning of the war by doing this real on the ground work, obviously with the assistance of Doctors Without Borders and other local organizations. Um, so, yeah. When we talk about the war as we know it right now, you call it, I mean, it's not been labeled a war, but we in fact know that it is a war. Uh, and you talked about the UN evacuating in part of what you what you discussed. I want to get the United States perspective in here too, right? The, the US has failed to really sufficiently intervene within all of this. What are we looking at by way of the United States and the lack of intervention? Why, why are we there? I mean, I really wish I could. I mean, I think on one level, the U.S. is probably has reckoned with its own history of destruction in the Middle East, with Afghanistan, with Iraq, with Syria, with Libya. The the, li the list of countries is endless. I think that they're they're afraid of the like. I think they're afraid of like this particular beast. And also, I don't think that the U.S. the U.S. was not even able to evacuate its own citizens. Like, I'm I'm a U.S. citizen myself. And I immediately, when the war broke out, I kept getting emails from the U.S. Embassy saying, we're not going to evacuate you. We have over 19,000 citizens in Sudan. We're not going to evacuate anybody because we don't have the capacity to do it. And so at the time of me getting these emails, I was actually, I was taking shelter at a farm that wasn't far from the U.S. Embassy. So I heard helicopters or jets come land at the embassy, and they took all of their staff, let the Sudanese, let the Sudanese staff behind, shredded U.S. passports, Sudanese passports that were there waiting for visas and just left. Like, I think to them, this was something beyond the scope of their own capacity, even though this is something that, you know, many people, including the U.S., probably could have anticipated. But, I mean, it's... If the country is not even able to evacuate its own staff. I think on some level they did a slight evac. They did a, a, a mini evacuation where they evacuated maybe 600 people from Port Sudan, but that was by way of the British. Like I myself left with the British convoy. The British and the EU were much were much quicker at getting their people out. A lot of other countries were actually getting their people out much faster, sending planes, sending jets, sending anything possible, uh, while the U.S. really took its time. So I truly just don't believe. I, it's either that the U.S. this is not a priority for the U.S., which wouldn't be shocking, yeah. or that the U.S. doesn't have the capacity to do it. But uh, from the way it was looking, like, I mean, the day I got to Port Sudan, there was an Indian ship, there was a Pakistani ship, all over there for its citizens. But the U.S. took its a long, long time to get there, to take its people. Yeah. Well, I want to let you know, Bayan, we are coming to the end of this segment, but I want to thank you for the work that you've done uplifting uh, this crisis that's going on. Uh, we also say the war. Uh, for those who have to uh, understand what's happening. And thank you for sharing with us. Of course, before we go real quickly, how can we continue to monitor the situation uh, very briefly? I mean, I think Al Jazeera does really good reporting. Uh, there's a page on Twitter called Sudan War Monitor that does really great uh, live day-to-day -day analysis of what's happening. There's a number of really important uh, uh, figures on Twitter, like, for instance, a woman named Khouloud Khair, who is an analyst. Perhaps I can send, um, I can send her a few links afterwards that can be sent out or put in the comments or something. Um, but yeah, I, I would recommend Sudan War Monitor and Al Jazeera's reporting on Sudan are both really good resources. Yeah, Bayan Abu Bakr, PhD candidate uh, of history at Yale University. Thank you for the great work that you're doing. Uh, and most of all, stay safe. Thank you for being with us. Okay, thank you so much. All righty. Well, Bye -bye. I want to let our people know we come to the end of our show today. Hope that you enjoyed this week's discussion on the Bronx Social Justice and Anti-Violence Forums. Now, before we end the show, I want to take a time to celebrate BronxNet. BronxNet has been lighting up your screens and hearts for an incredible 30 years. And uh, from the heart of the Bronx to your homes, we've been sharing in a family, sharing stories of dreams and taking the pulse of our vibrant community. So join us as we celebrate three decades of unity, diversity, and the magic of all television that connects us all. So here's the BronxNet and the Bronx community, our past, our present, and our exciting future. Well, to rewatch this week's edition of Social Justice, you can recatch the cable cast on BronxNet.org. Also, join in on the conversation, present your point of view. Visit our social media at BronxNet TV. Join us next week. We'll elevate the discussion and bring further awareness across the globe. I am Darren Hyman saying take care and thank you for watching Social Justice.